My name is Jennifer Berg. Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 21, and follow along with me as I read. It is page number 1756 in the Blue Bible. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger." Just as, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on who I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, church. Good to be together here, whether you're in the sanctuary or in our Connection Cafe or perhaps watching from home on the live stream. If that scripture reading sounded familiar to some of you, we did read many of those verses last week as well. This is part two of a two-part sermon on God's sovereignty. And so last week we started by looking at Romans 9 and looking at six different examples of God's sovereignty. Uh, as creator of all things, God can do whatever he wants to do for his own glory. He can do what he wants to do for his own purposes in this world. Today, now, we're going to look at sovereignty again, but we're going to approach it a little bit more topically. We're going to look at the doctrine of election. It can be defined as God's sovereign right to call and to choose as he deems best, regardless of who we are or what we've done or not done. Now, I know that this aspect of God's sovereignty caught a few of us off guard a little bit uh, last week. In fact, some of us are still feeling a little bit on our heels, like, whoa, what, what is this all about? Certain features of election can be difficult to understand and difficult to accept. This is especially true last week when we looked at this Hebrew idiom, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. We were also kind of piqued our attention when we read that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and he will harden whom he wants to harden. Many of us could relate quite well when we got to verse 19. Then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? So do we humans really have any choice in the matter? As a matter of fact, yes, we do. In fact, God, the God of this universe, he holds all of us accountable for how we live, for what we do and say, for the life we live on this planet. In fact, when we get toward the end of Paul's letter, same letter, Romans 14, 12, it says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So God does hold us responsible for our human decisions, 
in all that we do. But how does that work? How can God make us give an account for our actions when he's the one calling the shots? That's interesting. There's a dynamic tension here between the sovereignty of God, God's sovereign election, and our human responsibility, between God's will and our will, his choices and our choices. A dynamic tension there. These two teachings seem to be in direct opposition to each other. How can they both really be true at the same time? It's a fair question. If it's any consolation, Bible scholars have been wrestling with this for a long time. Probably written thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of words have been written on this very topic trying to figure this out. So we're in good company. And the reason we continue to wrestle with this is both of these teachings, both of these ideas show up in the biblical text. They are there. So in good conscience, we need to admit that these are both taught in Scripture, and we have to wrestle through them together. So we're going to do that. Now, at this point, there may be a few of us, uh, perhaps a few of you, who are thinking kind of what I was thinking. Paul, why did you stick this in the middle? The first eight chapters, I mean, we're we're so great. Why did you drop chapter 9 in the middle? I mean, we're coming on some really good stuff toward the end of the letter. Why? Right in the middle of all this. But here's the thing. It really wasn't Paul's idea. Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is the one who intended, who wanted these words and this teaching to land right here, smack dab in the middle of this gospel letter. Apparently, we need to know it. It is important for us to think about this. So we dare not give up on this doctrine of election. We need to wrestle with it. We need to come to grips with it, get our head around it as best we can, and allow it to mold us and shape our understanding of what the gospel means, what is true about the good news. But I'm pretty sure we're going to need a lot of help from the Lord. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to this text again this morning and focus on this topic of election We just admit that it has uh, thrown some of us for a bit of a loop. It has created some questions and confusion in our minds. And so we come to you for help. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you might help us to rightly understand this topic, rightly apply it to our lives, to know what it means, and how we can glorify you as we come to grips with it. So, Lord, please help. In this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as confusing as this doctrine can get, sometimes it can cause us to make some missteps in our thinking, some missteps in our belief system, perhaps even come to some wrong conclusions. Here would be an example, a couple examples of some wrong conclusions we might reach. Since... God has elected these things and he is sovereign. Maybe I shouldn't bother praying. It's all determined already. I mean, I know Pastor Eric, he wants me to come to Second Sunday Prayer next Sunday night, but what's the point of praying if it's all been predetermined? Perhaps there's no point in repenting of my sin, no point in living a righteous life. I might as well just go out and party it up and live crazy because then eventually at the end, I suppose I'll find out whether I'm one of the elect or not. If God hated Esau, how do I know God doesn't hate me? How do I know that God loves me? Doesn't election really just mean that we're all a bunch of robots, we're just kind of pre-programmed, and God has determined just how it's going to go, and we're just kind of following our programming? To be clear, those would be some wrong conclusions that we might come to. 
But it's understandable why we might wonder about those things, why we might think those things, because it does get a little confusing here and we get a little discombobulated. In fact, that's probably the perfect word. Discombobulated is how we may be feeling. As confusing as it might feel, election is not meant to discourage us. It's not meant to frustrate us. And if it's causing you at all to feel fearful or or unsure or unsettled, then I want to call all of us together to take a closer look today. Try to learn more. Try to get a little bit better grasp on this. So as we explore the doctrine of election, it reminds us to keep Scripture's broader context in view. We're going to look at four examples of this broader context, and then when we get to the second point, we'll look at four other things. First of all, God loves and pursues lost sinners. That is a scriptural context that we need to keep in mind. Even though there were things that we needed to learn last week about this Hebrew idiom of loving Jacob and hating Esau, we shouldn't let that have the final word on God's love for mankind. John 3.16 still holds true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. However, this dynamic tension works itself out between God's election and our human responsibility, the reassuring truth of John 3.16 still stands. That is the truth of God's word. So we shouldn't think of lost people as casualties of God's elective choice. Even though Paul delivers this challenging teaching about election in Romans 9, let's not forget how he began the chapter. Do you remember how he began two weeks ago? With a burden for the lost, deep sorrow, unceasing anguish for his lost brethren. And Paul's concern for lost sinners echoes the very heart of God. He loves the world. We have to hold our understanding of God's election in check with God's loving patience. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We touched on this a little bit last week. We looked back at Romans 2.4. God's kindness leads us to repentance. The patient, kind heart of God trying to lead a rebellious people to repent, to turn to Him, to turn to the hope of Christ that He has provided for us. That is the heart of God. So we need to keep that in context, not allow the doctrine of election to throw us off kilter or distract us from God's passionate pursuit of the lost. There is none righteous, no, not one. No one who seeks God, but he sure seeks us. The broader context also includes the fact that God's open gospel invitation is right around the corner. We're in Romans 9, we'll be in Romans 10 soon. It openly declares in 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So right after, Romans 9 focuses on God calling certain people, electing certain people to himself. Romans 10 then zeroes in on everyone who calls on him. It shows the other perspective. Reveals our human responsibility to call on the name of the Lord. And even though we need God's help to make us, help us make that choice, we need God to help us with that, nonetheless, we still have a personal choice to make each one of us. So as we mentioned, our human responsibility, it stands in this dynamic tension with God's sovereign election. So yes, as we discussed last week, it is true. It is God's sovereign right to call and to choose. But it is also our responsibility to call on the Lord, to choose to follow Jesus. Whatever these 
truths are that we're learning about the gospel from the doctrine of election, they're held in this dynamic tension by a gospel invitation that's not closed to anyone. But how can it be both? (laughs) How could both God and humans have a choice in the matter? How's that work? Well, even though it's challenging to weave these two together, we must admit that they are standing shoulder to shoulder. Romans 9, Romans 10. And so we take them together and we wrestle through it. The broader context of Scripture includes the fact that God has done a lot to remove our human hard-heartedness. Last week, we talked about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. If you look back into the book of Exodus, look back into the story. If, if any of you have read through that any time recently, you may recall that there are nine different times where God hardens Pharaoh's heart. But there are also nine different times where Pharaoh hardens his own heart toward God. In fact, the hardening begins with him as you read through the story. The hardening started with Pharaoh. And to take this even one step further, the hardening of our human hearts actually started with the entire human race. We learned about this way at the beginning as Paul was writing this letter. He started in Romans 1, pointing out the godlessness and wickedness of the human race. He caused us to think about that in context well before we got to Romans 9. We don't give God the glory He deserves. We're not thankful to our Creator for all He has done and all He has given us. That is not our normal human tendency. We are rebels. We are hardened against God. So it doesn't take very much for God to harden sinners because they're already hardened against Him. Now, it's certainly true. We talked about this last week that sometimes God uses the hardness in people like Pharaoh. And sometimes he hardens them even further for his sovereign purposes, his greater elective purposes. But God has done so much to soften our hearts. We find this throughout Scripture. God trying to take a hard human heart and soften it toward him. An example of this is God predicting this very thing in Israel's history, Ezekiel 36, 26. God says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you what you can't do on your own. I'll provide for you the heart that you need because you won't get there on your own. Just imagine if God had left it up to us to soften our own hearts. He'd said, hey, you guys figure this out on your own. Where do you think you would be if God had not softened your heart? I imagine where I would be today if God had not reached down and softened my heart and by his spirit through faith in Jesus had given me a new heart exactly what I needed for my salvation. I wasn't going to get there on my own. If God had risked our salvation by leaving it up to us, none of us would have received his mercy. None of us would be saved. We wouldn't have got there on our own. So God not only saves us from our sin, he saves us from the hardness of our hearts. He saves us from our rebellion. So keeping this broader context in view, it challenges us to dig deeper, to think more carefully, to love God with our mind, heart, soul, mind, and strength, but our mind today. We love him deeply. There's still so much for us to learn and grow in together. We won't get it done in one sermon or two sermons. So if you are wrestling with this teaching on election in Romans 9, I challenge you and encourage you to dig in, to go deeper, to learn more. Be like the Berean Jews, Acts 17, 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness 
and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, I'm not suggesting that what Paul said in Romans 9 might not be true. Don't hear me wrong. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I am suggesting we may need to dig in. It is good for us when God's word challenges us, when it makes us think more carefully and go, okay, well, maybe I made some assumptions here. I need to maybe back up and take a look at God's word and let it form me, let it change me, teach me what is true about the gospel. Lord, lead us to a fuller, fuller understanding of himself and of the good news of Jesus. Now, I began this sermon intentionally using this phrase, dynamic tension. If you Google that word, dynamic tension, you'll find that it's actually a reference to muscle building. I don't know how many of you came here to get bigger muscles, but that is the illustration. Dynamic tension is where one muscle group is pushing against another muscle group, and as they push against each other, they both become stronger. That's a dynamic tension. And sometimes that's exactly what we need in our theology and in our spiritual formation. We need God's sovereign will and our human free will to be in tension with each other. And we look at these verses as they push back and forth against each other and it matures us and it grows us and it makes us stronger. And that's part of God's design. He has designed this dynamic tension to be here and it's good for us. So rather than election tearing our faith apart, Election should be making it stronger as we think about God's sovereignty. It will strengthen us and renew us, tearing down some things and rebuilding spiritual muscle. So be open to that. Receive that. Ask God to help with that. I like how Pastor John Piper says it. The crucible of God's sovereignty is good for us. Now, crucible's not comfortable, but it's good for us. Turn up the heat, mash some things around, bring on the crucible, and grow through that fire. So let's hang in there, folks. Let's press on together. And I should also mention, because this is a perfect time to think about this, coming to church one hour a week will not be enough. If you want to wrestle with doctrines like election and a hundred others like it, you'll need more than one hour of church a week. So we need to come to Sunday school. We need to join a Bible study. We need to be part of a life group and encourage each other and challenge one another and iron sharpening iron. There's still so much for us to learn and grow in together. With this broader context in mind, let's now take a look at some of the encouraging truths that we find in election. Some of the highlights that election brings to the gospel. Exploring this doctrine magnifies many wonderful gospel truths. Whenever we first begin to consider election, it has some ramifications that can feel a little uncomfortable. They come across that first rather harsh, even unloving. But the longer we think about it, the more we probe into it and examine it more closely, what we're going to find is some beautiful treasures, many wonderful gospel truths. So let's look at four of those. Election magnifies the gospel truth that God's mercy is marvelous. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, while we were still sinners... That's when Christ died for us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God doesn't owe any one of us salvation. He doesn't owe us. For us to think that election is somehow unfair because it only shows some of us mercy and It misses the bigger question. Why would God show any of us mercy? 
He didn't need to do that. Good thing for us he did, (laughs) that God is also loving. But in his justice, he did not need to do that. What would actually be completely fair would be for all of us to be condemned. Because we are all sinners. And the wages of sin is death. That's a fair wage. You see, we're quick to jump to the cross of Jesus Christ. And of course, we're desperately in need of it. It's our only hope. So of course we would be. But election causes us to slow down and think again about the marvelous mercy of God that he poured this out on us. Along with doing all of these things for his own glory, he also is doing these things for our benefit, for our spiritual blessing. He keeps us in mind as he's doing all this. Remember back in Romans 8, 28, how we delighted in Romans 8, 28? What a wonderful verse. God works for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. That's a great verse, a great hope, a great joy. God working for the good of those who love him. And God working for our good includes his work of election. That is his good work. It is for his glory, but it is also for our benefit on our behalf. So even as this doctrine of election declares that God has a right to call and to choose, it is also magnifying and revealing the love of God, his marvelous mercy, his compassionate nature. It's right in this same text. Election also magnifies the gospel truth that God's salvation is fully secure, completely secure, despite human sinfulness. This problem that we humans have with sin is sometimes referred to as total depravity. Sounds like just like what it sounds. It it is total depravity. Ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden, the human race has been in desperate need of rescue. Rescue from our sin nature, the sin nature that we inherited from Adam. We talked about this back in Romans 5. We are in Adam until we find faith so that we can be in Christ. Paul has laid out all this theology, all this teaching before he got to Romans 9. Despite what some people might try to tell you, what our society might propose, we cannot and will not become an improved species through better education, better governance, better distribution of wealth, or better anything else. Those are good things. Those can be helpful. But that is not the answer for the human race. That will not solve our ultimate problem. Our big issue with sin will not be solved by any of those things. And if we begin to believe that we can make this world better on our own, that we can make ourselves better, we fall into this heresy of Pelagianism. Big word, fancy word, Pelagianism. Pelagianism teaches that we don't really need any help from God. We don't need his help. We can just decide of our own free will that we're going to be a good person. We're going to make our life better on our own. We can do that. We just have to decide to be good. Can you imagine if God left it up to us to be good on our own? How good would you be on your own? How good would I be on my own? Solve my own sin problem. Fortunately, God does not do that. Rather, through his sovereign plans and election, he does the calling. He does the choosing, rather than leaving it up to us. Sadly, there are more and more people in our society today who promote this idea that we can be good enough on our own. They've fooled themselves. They've fooled many other people into thinking that we really don't need God to save us. We'll just try harder. We'll work hard together. We can do this together. If we all kind of pull together for a better future, we're going to get there. 
But if our efforts were enough, then the Heavenly Father would not have needed to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to the cross. If we could get there on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus. There would have been no rescue plan because we could have, you know, figured it out on our own. Romans 9.31 says that the Israelites tried to attain their own righteousness apart from Jesus. And you know what? Didn't work. (laughs) And it won't work for us Gentiles if we tried to do it on our own, to establish our own righteousness apart from faith in Jesus. There will not be success. God's sovereign election unto salvation guarantees that his gospel plans will not be thwarted by our faulty human efforts, our limited human ability. For the sake of his own name, he will not let the gospel fail. And for the sake of his love for us, he will not let the gospel fail. Part of why he keeps a remnant, which we'll talk about more in weeks to come. So those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ for our salvation are absolutely secure. We can be confident fully in the salvation because God's got it. He's in control of it by his election, by his sovereign will. Election also magnifies the gospel truth that salvation is always and only by grace alone. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Absolutely nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing we can drum up from within ourselves somehow to to be worthy of it or say, well, God, I know I'm not the greatest, but I got this one thing here. Will that be enough? Nothing. Romans 9, 11 and 12. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. One of the driving concerns of people who have a more Calvinistic perspective is that we must be absolutely clear on this. We're utterly dependent on God to rescue us. Utterly dependent on God. And that's true. That is good theology. In fact, even our own efforts to put faith in God could be perceived as works, that somehow we got enough faith or we humbled ourselves enough or we surrendered ourselves enough that somehow God looked down and go, oh, that looks like a worthy candidate. They've humbled themselves enough. And in our human self-righteousness, we think, oh, so I did bring something to the table. It did take something for me in order to God, for God to save me. God's sovereign election puts all of our merits to the side. There's nothing we bring to the table. Nothing we can do. Nothing we say. Nothing we earn. Absolutely grace. And aren't you glad that we don't have to work our way to heaven? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 comes to mind. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. No one. The doctrine of election humbles us, takes away any pride, any arrogance, any boasting we might try to bring, thinking that somehow we needed Jesus, but not as much as somebody else did. Takes that all away. Election reminds us that our salvation is only because God has chosen to call us to himself by his grace, by his mercy, by his goodness. That's the only reason. Salvation is always, only by grace alone. We need to know that and own that and be immensely grateful for that. God's beautiful mercy. His wonderful grace. One more way that election magnifies the gospel is by reminding us that God's word must remain our final authority for truth. 
One of the dangers here as we wrestle through the doctrine of election is that it might somehow begin to allow our human reasoning to think, okay, I got to figure this out. I might have to circumvent this one. This one's hard. I'm not sure I want to go through this one. I don't like this one and I can't quite figure it out. So I think I'll, I think I'll take another route and kind of go around election, kind of, kind of go around Romans 9 circumvent what the Bible actually teaches. It's one of the dangers. And this is already happening in many ways in many churches as we come to parts of the Bible that aren't as popular or aren't as, as palatable or aren't as easy to share. We think, well, let's you know, either tear that page out or just jump over that chapter or let's, let's kind of reinvent an understanding around that so that it doesn't really trouble us so much. In our human wisdom, we think we know better than God. We begin to think that our definition of truth is better than God's definition of truth. I mean, God's got a lot of it figured out, but a couple things here, you know, where we're going to just kind of do a little creative editing. For example, we begin to think that our sexual ethics are wiser than God's design for sex. Or any number of other examples we could come up with, many other ways that we begin to think that we know better than the Creator. Yes, He's established some things, but, you know, that's a little old school. We're going to go with something kind of new, something a little different. And we're in danger of doing the same kind of thing here with this doctrine of election. If we dare to tell God that we think His purpose is an election, that's unfair. That's not just. God, you can't, you can't do it that way. We use our finite and flawed human standards rather than trusting in God's standards and a God who is all-wise, who has infinite wisdom, flawless character. We need to go by His standards. If we become our own final authority for faith and doctrine, then our faith will become very human, very weak and unspiritual and ungodly and unhelpful. In Acts 20, 26, and 27, Paul says, Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So we need to submit to the whole will of God. Not do an end run, not circumvent. Even when it's confusing, even when it's frustrating, even when it's difficult to take it all in. You know, Paul actually sets a great example for us here in Romans 9. The opening verses of the chapter make it very clear that he wasn't just some cold-hearted theological egghead. Some, you know, member of the intelligentsia up in his ivory tower. He just doesn't get it. That was not Paul. Paul had great sorrow, unceasing anguish in his heart for his lost Jewish brethren. And even with that anguish and that grief and that sorrow... He didn't try to water down election or ignore this teaching. As tempting as it might have been for him to skip over it or maybe say it a little differently or try to make it a little bit more palatable, alter it a little bit, he didn't do that. He faithfully taught the truth. As the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, he wrote and he taught the truth. So he forces himself and the rest of us to wrestle our way through it because this is the very truth of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that even though it may be confusing or frustrating for us sometimes, this is still your holy word. Please continue to help us, Lord, to rightly understand your word. Rightly apply it and live it out. And Lord, please help us. We we plead with you that you would continue to help us as we struggle to navigate this tension between your sovereign will and our own human free will. But Lord, we choose to worship you by surrendering to your sovereign right to call and to choose as you deem best. So we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen.